Okay, everybody. We now have a presentation or a panel discussion. Um, intergenerational matters. That means the young people bringing everybody in. I am now going to turn it over to Rich Fiesta, who's going to monitor it and introduce all the participants. Uh, we've heard a lot this week about uh, these days about intergenerational. David K. Johnson spoke at, about it this morning, educating people on pensions. Robert in his opening speech yesterday. Uh, we need to engage people who are coming behind us and the importance of solidarity and working together. Common goals, achieving them, common tactics, working for them, learning languages that we all speak to reach those common goals. So today, we're gonna have a panel uh, discussion. We, our chapter in Chicago in particular has uh, a great intergenerational program going and uh, we have two folks from here uh, to talk about it uh, and they've been doing great things. Uh, seated beside me is B. Lumpkin. One of the great joys I've had working for the Alliance was this past August 3rd in Chicago where I was among the 300 plus people who celebrated B's 100th birthday. Uh -huh. <laughs> and she hasn't stopped. A month or so after her birthday, she flew off to Spain to participate in a seniors' rights demonstration and conference there. Yes. B has been an activist, uh, well, her entire life. <laughs> That's now a century old. Uh, she started in New York organizing laundry workers, ended up in Chicago as a teacher, uh, taught at Malcolm X College, uh, wrote textbooks on the contributions of minorities and African Americans in the development of mathematics, uh, her field, all the way back to the ancient Egyptians. Uh, and has been involved in racial and social and labor rights uh, and is an inspiration to us all. And part of it is the, being the co-founder of Intergen, which is the intergenerational organization our Chicago chapter is involved with. And working with Leticia and that is, with B on that, is Lakeisha Collins, who is a, an SCIU healthcare member. She is a nursing home worker uh, by day and a union organizer with SEIU by night, day, and everything in between. <laughs> uh, she, she and B are the co-founders of Intergen. Uh, Lakeisha is also involved with the Fight for 15, Healthcare Illinois, tuition free campaigns as well. Uh, founder of in her own union, SEIU Future Fighters, a group of young members training others against uh, racial injustice, and she's president of the Future Fighters Chicago chapter as well. So welcome, Lakeisha. And then sitting uh, beside Lakeisha is Andrea, Andrea Weaver uh, from Massachusetts, who is living in an energization intergenerational family uh, and is working in her Bridges Growing Together organization based in Massachusetts is about bringing organizations together so that generations can work, train, and grow together uh, as well. She's authored quite a number of scholarly uh, articles in the area on how intergenerational work can be grown and how we can all achieve common goals that way and has even developed a curriculum uh, on that as well. So, welcome to everybody. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna start with Andrea, because you put some little cards on the tables uh, at everybody's seat. So tell us about those. Thank you. Hopefully everybody has a little card at your seat. We call these our grand conversation cards and we use them to help unite people of all ages, but especially people, older adults and youth. And we invite you, maybe in the break, to take your card and, and ask each other questions, start a conversation with someone whom you don't know well, learn something about someone whom you do know well, 
bring them home for your Thanksgiving dinner table and enjoy the conversations that will flow. So when we're talking about intergenerational work, it really is about building teams with our colleagues, standing shoulder to shoulder with other people and organizers, but then it's also finding our commonalities with people of all ages. Thank you. So, why do you think, let's start with Andrea. Andrea, uh, why is intergenerational programming and development important? <laughs> What's it's, your word? It's so important for so many reasons, but first I want to thank you and Robert for organizing, along with Brendan and Maureen, who helped to make this panel happen. So, intergenerational is important because it works. Intergenerational programs purposefully and intentionally and thoughtfully bring together older adults and young people. Traditionally in the field, and there is a field of intergenerational studies, it was people that were, the, that were skipped generations, the same at grandparent, grandchild age, which is fluid, as we know grandparents can be all different ages, but that sense that the middle generation is missing. Um, on purpose, by design, to allow the older adults and young people to really unite. And over time, intergenerational has come to mean multiple generations. There are all different types of, one, of intergenerational programs. There are certainly one-time events, like Labor Day celebrations. Um, it could be Alliance members going in to talk to history classes about the importance of, of unions throughout American history. It might be Alliance members going into Vogue Tech programs to talk to them about joining a union when they enter a trade. Could be short-term programs. I spoke with Mary Alice at lunch, who volunteers with graduating seniors, college seniors, to meet with them over several sessions to answer their questions about entering professional careers. And she shared how she helped mentor a senior in college as he prepared to purchase his first home. And then there can be ongoing programs. Also at my table, Hattie shared about how she volunteers in an elementary school regularly. Um, it can also be teaching crafts and skills over a number of weeks. Intergenerational programs are mutually beneficial. We want to make sure that everybody, the older adults, the young people, and the staff who are organizing all benefit. It becomes a way to transmit both ways, energy and education, and to help bring about change in the communities. It vaccinates against ageism. Ageism is very real. It's per pervasive. It's insidious, and people aren't talking about it. It affects all of us of all ages. When David K. Johnson spoke this morning about not being able to start his pension because he was only 19, that's ageism at work right there. And so intergenerational programs can help change that. Children as young as three show the seeds of ageism. And so starting with children who are young and helping them to change their perceptions, and that's what the Bridges Growing Together program does that I started. Um, it can improve our social and emotional and intellectual well-being. Social isolation is on the rise with older adults and adolescents. It has the health detriments of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And intergenerational programs help to nullify that and unite people. and. Additionally, when we create positive attitudes about aging, when I look at B and I say, wow, when I'm 100, I want to be traveling the world. I want to be bringing about changes. It can change my health outcomes so that people with positive attitudes about their own aging can increase their life expectancy by seven and a half years. And so it behooves all of us to help start those seeds young. And lastly, it, it prepares young people to work with older adults and to work for older adults and to work alongside older adults. People are living longer. It's called the longevity dividend. By the year 2025, we'll have more adults over the age of 65 than youth under the age of 13. How many people knew that? Fact. And so we need to raise up a workforce that's going to help to support this changing demographics. That's called the longevity economy. It's valued at approximately $8 trillion. And so helping young people realize that it, older adults have a lot of value and they're fun to be with and it's really neat to have a career working with older adults is important. So, B, you started a program in Chicago. 
intergenerational. How did that happen? What got you motivated? <clears throat> I'm short, so I might as well. <laughs> I might as well stand up to the occasion. <laughs> You have on your table a folder that will tell uh, more than I could in a few minutes. It was the program we used to officially launch. We call it InterGen, the Intergenerational Alliance of Elder and Youth activists. We emphasize activism uh, both in our IARA chapter and in our work with the um, uh, youth. If you turn to the uh, inside about us, The, I'll read the first sentence. The new intergenerational alliance of retiree and young activists was begun in early 2016 through leadership of the Chicago Metro retirees. And that's, I'm not the co-founder because almost every member of our chapter not only contributed financially, but worked actively uh, to try to cement our alliance. So in addition to the chapter of the Illinois Alliance for Retired Americans, uh, we had the active participation of the future fighters of SAIU healthcare, and we're lucky enough to have a representative. And I don't know if it's making history for us, for the ARA, but have we had youth panelists before? <laughs> but, so let's give Lakeisha a big welcome. But I'll predict there'll be more. Yes. At the, uh, near the bottom, update may be the most important uh, section here. It's our e email address of IARA uh, for a link to the video that you'll see, a longer video that will do a better job than I can in explaining exactly how uh, it developed. And hopefully I don't talk too long and we can get around to uh, the fourth question coming up. <laughs> Which, uh, or I think it's the third, what structure did you use? This will give you some insight. But unlike one of our inspiring movements, which was the Occupy movement, mostly young people, we do believe in structure, and that can make the difference in just hopeful goals and actual achievement. Well, I once was a teenager. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't forgotten it, in part because it was a very uh, foundational time in our history because I was able to be part of that huge movement 
that pushed Franklin D. Roosevelt to championing the New Deal and our safety net. Wow. And yes, FDR deserves our applause, but it wouldn't have happened without us, labor, progressive community, pushing behind and making it possible for him to create such vast changes. The very safety net we're fighting to defend and extend right now. I don't need to talk a lot longer, although I feel like it. <laughs> but I actually, thanks to the work we're doing with Intergen, I actually had a sort of revelation of that period so long ago in time, but close to what we're fighting for now. And that was the tremendous youth movement that I was part of and first came into in high school. Then it was the National Student League and it was in every high school in New York City and certainly every public college. That, the safety net that we won, it was mostly young people who did it. Guess how old Walter Rufo was when the uh, Social Security passed, 28. These are just some I remember. And I did check on the internet for the exact ages because, you know, <laughs> I could have. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Curran of the National Maritime Union, 27. And here's my favorite. The man who was president of UE, then a union of 500,000, was 25 years old. So our youth movement now goes up to 35 or, or older, and, and that's okay, because you need so much more education for many of the jobs we have, and hopefully we can keep people living longer. And so at this point, I'll save the rest of it for the other wonderful questions we'll get. Truly said by somebody who was there, <laughs> yes. organizing workers before and after the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, right? Yeah. Lakeisha, what made you want to get involved and, and join this intergenerational fund? So I'll give the real short version. <laughs> um, I started out in labor when I was 22, 21. And um, I had just had a baby at the time, so I dropped out of school just to try to make sure I could take care of my, ch my son. I didn't know um, much about labor or like how important it was at that time. And I didn't have anybody to really explain it to me because my, I don't come from a background of labor. And so I just knew working in a nursing home um, that the things I was seeing and experiencing was wrong. Um, I knew for a fact that it wasn't our fault as the employees that we didn't have enough diapers, uh, cleaning supplies, or enough staffing. Um, it wasn't like how it was when I took the training for the position, 
but I just knew something needed to change. And so I ended up meeting a rep at the time named Kim Scott, and um, she invited me to a meeting where it was all broken down as to why it was important to get involved with the union and the many fights that were ahead of us. And so from that meeting and talking to a Generation Xer, uh, which is my mentor, Shaba, um, I've been involved ever since. So for 11 years as a member, I moved um, from just being an activist to a steward to an executive board member. And then um, before I got on staff two years ago, um, we talked to some of our leaders in our organization about making spaces for young people to, you know, share their ideas, be creative, and um, have a voice in our local. And so that ended up becoming an international thing where there were committees built all across our union uh, where young workers were given those spaces to not take over the organization, but to just learn from, you know, our elders, you know, that pretty much paved the way for us. Um, we started talking more about retirement and the importance of protecting pensions, healthcare, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, I wanna say when we started those, those committees, because we started to talk about not just like what we're living in the now, because that's what young people think about, what's happening right now. So like if I have a bill due right now, I'm thinking about how I'm gonna pay that bill. I'm not thinking about the long term of not paying the bill or not having health care or um, intuition um, free, you know, education or, you know, we don't think about a lot of things long term, but now we're starting to talk about it and making it a priority. So how I got involved with Intergenerational Alliance is when I went to a convention about four years ago where I heard a, you know, um, I went to a workshop around retirees and I was blown away because I'm like, I didn't know how important this stuff was. I didn't know that, you know, um, I didn't think 15 or 20 years ahead to the point where if for whatever happens, you know, I have to go into a nursing home or I need a home health care aid that I wouldn't have these programs at the rate that we're going right now with, you know, our some elected officials that are cutting everything. And so now I just made it a priority to bridge that gap because I felt like a lot of young people didn't understand, you know, that we didn't get to where we are right now just by luck. It was someone who built this, this pathway to where we are. And we have to, have to respect our elders and we have to learn from them as well. And we can't just block them out because they fight differently from us, right? And so I just thought it was important to build a, a committee of young and elders um, who fought around the same thing and who were equal to each other. And I think with our organization, Intergenerational Alliance, everyone is equal in that room. Everyone shares the same idea. It might come out a little bit differently, but we all are on the same page and we all have the same goals. And so I'm just grateful to be a part of such an amazing alliance with such amazing people who I learned from. Great. That's Thank the you. shortest version I could give. <laughs> so today's Chicago, tomorrow the world. Yeah. So Andrea, Hopefully. Andrea, tell us about uh, other groups that uh, us and other younger workers. How? What kind of structure should an intergenerational alliance have? So, as we've heard in such great examples, it, in order to be sustainable and impactful, it's really important to start with a committee, as Lakeisha said, and as Lakeisha and B have done, or as we call it, a leadership team, with representatives from the different groups, as we see here. That way we can share what are the interests of the peers in our groups, what are the abilities, what are the foci, and to have members of the different groups as appropriate. So together, that leadership team can decide what are the goals, what are the objectives. They can publicize the event, recruit participants, share the resources that are necessary to lead an effective program, and then to evaluate as they move forward to see what was successful, what improvements can be made to strengthen things. That team can continue to meet regularly, as we see B and Lakeisha have done. And it's a matter of collaborate, and collaborate comes from the Latin root to work together, and that's really what intergenerational programming is about. And it sounds like that's what you followed in Chicago, you had groups from both sides.
for uh, not both sides. They're they're on the same side <laughs> but from both generations. Well, yesterday uh, we asked uh, for a show of hands as to how many people were involved uh, in local work uh, for the ARA. And uh, not everyone raised their hand. So uh, as uh, we just heard, uh, this can be done at uh, intergenerational work can be conducted at different levels. And as Lakeisha told us, it can and must, I think, take place in the local unions as well as community organization. Mm -hmm. uh, very important to bring up new young leadership. In our case, it started with the Illinois ARA State Board mm -hmm. that did set up a committee towards organizing a Chicago metro area chapter of the ARA. And Hopefully, this can be done in more towns and cities and counties. Uh, that took almost two years for us to get organized. Uh, but I think it paid off because whenever there were rallies or lobbies or mass phone calls, there were more people already actively involved. Uh, and then leading towards the intergen, we had speakers at our, uh, not every monthly meeting because our members like to talk too. <laughs> and we try to make it possible for most of our meeting to be conversation, exchange of ideas. But we had a speaker from Fight for 15, <clears throat> and I saw our retirees' faces just light up in big smiles. And then when we marched in their rallies, and we know there are plenty plenty of retirees working at McDonald's and places like that. But the bulk of the marches were young people, many in their teens. Uh, that's where you begin to make your contacts, get email addresses. Next step was forming that committee we all talked about. And that, uh, and then uh, Lakeisha, for one, said, why don't we have a retreat? That sounded great. And even though a tornado tore up the UAW uh, Recreational Center in Illinois, that didn't stop the Intergen Committee. They got a quick substitute. We cut it down from two days to one day. Uh, but it was still wonderful. Last point, it takes money. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough to hire an organizer. And some of our members with those <coughs> skills really just donated countless numbers of hours. Uh, but all of our members donated. It was $20 uh, to attend for retirees, 10 for young people, but scholarships were very readily available. And people who were too proud to <coughs> ask for a scholarship we pretty well knew who they were, and we pressed it on them. Uh, 
So it can be done at, at any level, but wouldn't try to do it like Occupy did. We learned from that movement. It was a wonderful, mostly youth movement, but they didn't believe in structure. They did change the conversation to the inequality of income and wealth, but they didn't last. And we mean for this to last. And, Lake and Lakeisha, that worked for you, this yes. structure? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Bringing peers. Well, and part of it is we have a video to show some of the fruits of your work. Well, this is inspiring us to take this out of Chicago and across the country. So, Andrea, you're our expert. Uh, what are some key points in this, in growing? growing. Thank you. So after you form your leadership team or your committee to think about what will your program look like when you get together and whether you do this one time or repeat it multiple times as they're doing with the Intergen Alliance, which is so great. To remember, as B mentioned before, a flexible structure, that there's a structure. For example, they had workshops, but it's flexible. There were three options. And when we bring the generations together, we want to have some sort of structure, but we want everybody to be able to share and to participate in something that interests them or participate in a level that's comfortable for them. So that flexible structure is really important. Uh, and taking it to a very personal level as we get together for Thanksgiving coming up, the same thing, we can say, sometime over this day, I'd like to take a walk outside. What time do you want to do it before or after the meal? So there's that structure, but there's flexibility with it. But going back to the unions and the work that can be done. In planning, we consider, when, when we're planning a program, we think about five aspects. The first is an icebreaker, where people really get a chance to talk to one another, connect with one another, a formal introduction in a fun and welcoming way. The second thing we want to make sure is included is a mini lesson or an overview to the day so that everybody walks away with some new knowledge, something to think about, something to build on, something to intrigue them. The third thing is life review and discussion questions where people can share their history. What inspired you to get involved? When did you realize that it's important to vote? What was the most important demonstration you were a part of? The fourth thing is to do some type of project. The best way to break down the barriers that we've put up, whether it be race or age or anything else, is to work on a common project where everybody is a collaborator. There are no experts. Um, there are all teachers and learners. And so working in that common project is really important. So in this case, um, they had three different on their retreat, there were three different workshops, and then to say, how are we going to move this forward and let's come up with a plan so everybody could collaborate on coming up with that plan. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you did, but that's one option. And then the last thing is a conclusion where everybody reports back, each group reports back on highlights and next steps for their group. As a bonus, when possible, it's nice to break bread and to share a meal together because it just helps to reinforce our humanity as people on this journey of life. So it also really helps to start with a theme and to narrow it down. How, for example, a theme might be how are we going to work together to bring about um, voter registration, if that's what our theme might be, or on the fight for 15, that might be a theme one time. But as in, educators will say that having those themes helps everybody assimilate the information and integrate that information with previous experiences and create inroads to move it forward. So those are some of our top steps. So B, what would you tell <coughs> retirees who are interested in programming and intergenerational alliance work? I would uh, pick up with what Andrea just said about being flexible. Uh, you have to start where you are, but wherever you are in terms of uh, 
a local chapter or not, there are things that can be done as simple as a press conference on press, a pressing issue, and we don't like those, do we? <laughs> A press conference that's jointly put on by youth and elder <coughs> organizations and those in between. Uh, so given the shortness of our time, I'll pass the mic. <laughs> Thank you, B. <laughs> and we should all take this home. Anytime someone who's 100 years old says be flexible, Pay attention. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, Pay yes. attention. <laughs> she didn't get there by accident, did you? <laughs> Lakeisha, what do you tell uh, young people to interact with all these retirees and its importance? The time is now to change um, the way things have been in the past. Um, Simply what I tell folks is that one day you're going to get in age and you have to have a plan and you have to make sure that there are programs that help you um, are still there. They're still existing. You know, we have to get out of being so small minded and thinking that, you know, things are going to continue to be that things are going to be handed to us. So we have to continue to fight for what it is that we need and what we want. Um, and I envision a future where you know, my health care <laughs> is free um, and that my kids can go to college and not have to worry about having debt and that, you know, I can retire with dignity and I can be, you know, comfortable because of the environment that I, that I used to work in where, you know, nursing homes um, don't have a good reputation. And that's pretty much a lot of the workers that I speak to a lot because I'm from that division. So that's pretty much all the young folks that I talk to about and I relate to them because of the work that we do. But I pretty much just tie them into what's happening in a nursing home, what they see, what our elders there, and do they wanna live like that? And about how important it is to fight to change the way the nursing home operates. Because to be honest, it's just a place where, you know, nursing home owners are, profi are profiting off, you know, our seniors. And so it's all about that. Like why it's important to engage with our elders to, change that environment. And that's what my passion lies at, is changing nursing homes and home care. So, and they pretty much get on board after that. Amen. Mm. Mm. No, you actually have a plane to catch to get back to <laughs> yes. Chicago. So, yes. we're the, so I know we could talk for hours, mm. literally, uh, about this. Anyone here inspired to go back home and start your own kind of youth and in, in a generational group? We have some expertise here from an expert in the field and real hands-on practical experience of what started in Chicago. Uh, and I think I'm inspired, uh, how can you not be, with three great people like this who have really branching the Jazzerings. And there are fundraising ideas too. Uh, B is very practical <laughs> of uh, getting her sponsors. They're in the... Um, brochure she passed out, but you, you need card. at least some structure, and structure occasionally requires some dollars. And it, not being able to pay with the scholarship program for people is very important, I think. It was a very good insight of uh, getting people there who are engaged and commit, committed, regardless of circumstance, should not be a barrier. And that is something the labor movement has fought for. For over, a, for even older than you, being even more than a hundred years. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes. I went to Hunter College of the City of New York. The most important word: free. Not one cent in tuition, and why? The labor movement before I was born had fought for it. Wow. There you go. Yes. Well, thank you to these incredible panelists and this great panel. You've only whetted our appetite, but <laughs> this is our future. 
uh, generations together, intergenerational work, marching through streets, having press conferences, and working towards our common goals. Thank you so very, very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And having fun at this. And having fun at the same time.